Bible, you would turn it to Matthew chapter number 4. Last few weeks, we've been looking at scripture that had to do with Jesus going out and calling his disciples unto himself, uh, telling them to follow me. That uh, was his invitation, and they accepted one thing I've always wondered about, it doesn't tell us, but I wondered if he ever went by and said, follow me, and some did not. I wonder if it was a missed opportunity. I wonder if it was some that decided that they would rather do what they wanted rather than what God had planned. Well, Jesus never asked us to do anything that he's not willing to do first. And that's really what we see here in Matthew chapter number 4. This is his follow me moment. So if you would, stand with us in honor of reading God's word. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He was led by the Spirit. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Then Satan quoted scripture, for it says, For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash you're foot against the stone. He's quoting Psalms 91, verse 11 and 12. Jesus said to him, It is written again, or it is also written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to, him, said to him, Away with you, say, For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I am grateful that you gave us the picture of what it means to follow you by, by Christ. Because, Lord, I know that John 5 says that Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father do. I pray, Lord, that we would only do what we see Jesus do. That we would follow him. And, Lord, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is uh, not going to be a popular <coughs> message among Satan and all those who are around him. So, Lord, I pray that you would expose lies, that you would proclaim truth. And by the power of the Spirit of God, that you would, uh, that you would uh, draw us to truth, draw us to yourself, draw us to life, and all the good that can come from it, the peace, the joy, the, the, the abundant life that comes from you. So Lord, uh, do what only you can do. Speak to hearts as only you can. Offer the invitation. To leave where we are and to come to you and to follow you with all of our hearts, soul, mind, and strength. Father, this is your word and there's power in your word. Unleash it, Holy Spirit, one heart at a time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Satan wants to do everything possible. To keep us away from Christ and His truth. He wants to do everything possible, his, his description, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He's not your friend. He doesn't care about you. He wants to trip you up. He wants to knock you down. He wants to kick you while you're down. He wants to hurt you. He loves shame. Are you good with that? And there are too many people that are living with shame. There are too many people that are living under lies. Now we understand that the Bible tells us 
that Satan is a liar. He is the father of all lies. I, I like how the New American Standard says it when he says, when Satan speaks, he speaks his native language. In other words, lying is his native language. This is who he is, and this is what he does. And the shame of it is, it works. The shame of it is, is we listen too much, too much of it. The shame of it is, is we get caught up in his lies. Romans chapter 1, verse 25, is an extremely uh, unveiling verse because it says, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. Why would we do such a thing? Listen to all of Why would we exchange a lie for truth? Or excuse me, a truth for a lie. Why would we take the word of God that is God's best for us and let it be, can't be tainted or twisted? Now, if Satan came at me with a full-blown lie, I would just absolutely just push it away. There'd be nothing attractive about that. But he doesn't come with me with a full lie. He comes with truth that usually are tied to life experiences, and he twists it and puts the lie in with the truth. Commingling. Partial lie. Partial truth. Now we all know that it may be 99% truth and 1% lie, and that makes it a 100% lie. Amen. But yet, we believe it. Matter of fact, not only do we believe it, in our life we have learned to lie to ourselves. And no matter of fact, we're comfortable with that. It's cute when we look at a little girl and we call her a princess. It's cute when we look at a little boy and we say, you're a pro baseball player. It's cute when we tell them that you're the smartest thing in the world because you can count from one to ten. But yet, somewhere in there, something as minor as what I just said, Satan will come and he'll hit us with truth, but he'll twist it and turn it because he wants to put a wedge between us and the Almighty God. The God who only knows truth. The God who only lives truth. The God who only blesses truth. God never blesses lies, and, and Satan knows that, and we fall prey to it. We become comfortable with partial truth. And over time, listen to me now, the lies that we believe become more true to us than the Word of God. We water it down. Now, I know you because you love God. You'd say this is the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. It's all true. Amen? Amen. But yet, but yet, when we look at this in our life experiences, we say, I know what the word of God says, but, and as my friend says, get your butts out of it. <laughs> Don't say, I, I, I believe this, but. Anytime you put but in there, you change it. You, you, you believe the lie. You've allowed commingling of lies and truth to come together. Now, I'm going to say something here that will be offensive to you, and I'm going to include myself in it. All of us do. All of us do. As a matter of fact, it scares me sometimes when I don't know it, I, and, and, and I find out no more. And I look at it, and I look at my life, and I'm like, I know that's wrong. And yet, sometimes it looks right. And I know this is God's good, right, and best, but yet, sometimes I'm uncomfortable with that. And I allow it to, to, to pull me down. Can I just say that all of us should and need to and want to accept God's best? Are y'all good with that? That's my prayer for you. It's my prayer that you get a heaven life, a pure life, a good life now. That you can walk the streets of these, this earth here. That you can face the
the circumstances and situations of life, and you can see it exactly the way heaven does. And we can live those. So look here in chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, if you've been told that God won't lead you in the difficult, cir in the difficult circumstances, you've been lied to. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. If you've been told that following the will of God will lead you into a path of comfort and ease, you've been lied to. If you've ever been told that the evidence of a true anointed walk with God is a pure path of blessing, you've been lied to. Satan is always there to come up and say, well, God doesn't love you because look at your circumstances. You're living in the wilderness right now. But this passage is more about trusting the will of God than facing temptation. Jesus is asking us to trust him. Jesus is asking us to follow him. And we prove that we trust him by how we follow him. We're living the word of God. He, it says that he was led in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He, he's fasting 40 days and 40 nights. And afterwards he's hungry. Now that's true. We need to understand that God has a plan for that. Even in Christ. The Bible says in John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The Word. That same chapter, verse 14, and it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Listen to me now. Full of grace and truth. Jesus is full of grace. Jesus is truth. John 14 said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. There's only one way of truth. There's only one way. John 8, 32 says this, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. <clears throat> now, I know that my job here at New Holland is to be your pastor, and one of the major responsibilities is to preach the Word of God. I'm a Bible preacher. I like going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, because there is no power in what I think. The power is in the Word of God. Amen? Amen. But listen, a lot of us have a lot of this knowledge in our head, and it doesn't help. When he says, and you shall know the truth, that word know does not mean just to have a lot of facts. You can quote it scripture and verse and it not affect your life. You can have a lot of knowledge of the word of God and never live it out in your life. Y'all know people like that? I met some of the dirtiest rotten scoundrels and I start talking to them and then all of a sudden when they find out I'm a preacher they just flip the switch and, and they can quote chapter and verse. They may know the word but the word doesn't know them. You see that word and you shall know the truth means to experientially know. It means not to know it in your head, but to know it because you're living it out in your life. That's when it becomes real. That's when it becomes alive. Now, I understand that my responsibility as your pastor is I am to be a dispenser of truth. I'm to come up here and, and I'm supposed to share the truth. But understand, I can't apply it to you. But the Holy Spirit of God wants to give you a head-on collision with truth and ask you, are you willing to believe it and live it and trust it? That's where life comes from. And there are too many people who have a little bit of an understanding, but they don't have enough trust and faith to live it. If I could beg you, I would. If I could plead, if I could grab a hold and say, please, just let God be God. Let Jesus be real and alive and allow him to bless. 
you know better, right? You know Christ. And Satan just laughs because he co-mingles the truth with life. Look what happens here. Jesus is out in the wilderness 40 days. Now, verse 2 is absolutely the most, I call it a dub on it. I mean, he, he went out and fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was hungry. Well, absolutely be hungry. Four hours I'm hungry. <laughs> and Satan came at his place of vulnerability. The tempter came to him and said, if you are, by the way, he knew who he was. He knew who he was. He was created by Jesus. He had been in his presence. His pride had lifted him up. But what he's trying to do is he's trying to take the truth, the Son of God, and he's trying to twist it and bring in some kind of a lie into it. He says, if you are the Son of God, command these stones, command that these stones become bread. He attacked him at an obvious need. By the way, this is the same tactic Satan used in the Garden of Eden. This is the same tactic, tactic that John talks about in 1 John. The lust of the flesh, he was hungry. The lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Nothing new under the sun. <coughs> what he's trying to do there is he's trying to say, if you are the Son of God, Here's the temptation. Change one thing into another. Stones make them something else. You're hungry. Take this rock over here and make bread out of it. Take something and make it into something else. Changing one thing into another. By the way, you don't need a shortcut. You don't need to turn. You just need to trust same way the thing he does with us. Don't let Satan turn money into your security. Don't let Satan take clothes, food, or houses and make them into how you are bagging. Don't let Satan come and call you beautiful or call you ugly. And change how you understand yourself. Don't be lifted up in pride and don't be beaten down. You are who you are. You are loved. You are special. Don't let all these other things that come into your life change your identity. Rick, I, I like you and I hope you like me. But if you don't like me, bless you. <laughs> I'm not going to let that change who I am. Y'all hear me? But so many people become codependent because they have to have somebody else's approval. It's a twisted, twisted lie. Don't let your circumstances get confused with God's love. Sometimes you may be like Jesus and be led by God into a difficult place. And yet you want to yell at God and be mad at God and angry with God because he's allowing you to be there. <laughs> when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about Peter. Jesus kept telling the disciples, we're going to go to Jerusalem. I will be rejected by the chief priests and the, and the Pharisees and I will, be, I will be taken and I will be crucified. I will die, but three days later I'm going to rise again. Matthew 16, Peter goes and says, hey Lord, come on now. You need to get over this. I, I'm tired of hearing this. Jesus, the rock's weak. It's going to be okay. It doesn't have to be this way. You don't have to worry about dying. Listen, what did Jesus do? Jesus spell around, looked, him, looked Peter in the face and said, Get behind me, Satan. Amen. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. He understood that Peter believed a lie. And, and, and he was using Peter as a tool, trying to get Jesus to, to fall into that lie too. But Jesus knew that he had to go to the cross. Wisdom.
wisdom is knowing it and calling it a lie. You don't need those other things. You don't need those other things. Jesus just looked at, looked at Satan in verse 4 and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What we need is the truth of God. That's the only thing that matters. By the way, it's the only thing that lasts. Verse 5, the devil took him up into a holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Then he quotes scripture to Now, come on now. Sometimes, have you ever heard this being preached or taught, that, that when Satan comes at you with a temptation, all you have to do is quote scripture back to him? Be careful, because he knows scripture better than you do. And, and this is what set me free here. In verse 7, Jesus said to him, it is written again. He, he's really saying, uh, it's also written. It's also written. There's something better written. Come on. I know this is not good grammar, Lynn, forgive me. There's something more good or about it. <laughs> that may be true, but there's something that's more true. You may feel that it's true, but there's something that's more true. You may feel blocked in, but I'm telling you, there's something that's more true. There's something that's better there. See, one is the truth of a situation. The other is the truth of a revelation. So many people are believing the lie of the situation rather than seeing the God of revelation. One is the truth of what you're going through. And by the way, it's true. But what is the truth of who is standing with you in that fire? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, don't do this or else. And they said, we're going to do it anyway. And they got thrown into the fire. Was that a truth? Yes. But there was a better truth who was with them in the fire. If you trust God, there will be some difficulties. But there's a greater truth. What you said is true. But I know something that's more true. Satan comes to me and says, you're a dirty, rotten sinner. Amen? But I know something that's more true. I'm a, I'm a saved, dirty, rotten sinner. Amen. He may try to beat me up with half-truths, but it's too late. God's already found me with the true God. I love what Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, we are hard-pressed on every side. That's true. But there was a greater truth, yet not crushed. He said, we are perplexed. That's true. But there's a greater truth. We're not in despair. We are persecuted, all right, but we're not forsaken. We are struck down, true, but we're not destroyed. Greater truth. We're always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. The doctor. You don't have to have a doctor. Sometimes you know the pain of life. You know what you're caring about. But there's a greater truth that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. That's true. That the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal flesh. That's more true. There are some things that you may be feeling in life and they may feel absolutely true to you. But I'm here to tell you there's something more true. Are you alone? Well, that may be true. But I'll tell you something better. There is someone who will never leave you or forsake you. You may be poor. That may be true. But I'll tell you what. In Christ you're rich. You see, sometimes we have to live with difficulty in time because God has a delayed gifting system. I tell everybody, preacher, what are you going to do for retirement? And I say, my retirement's out of this world. <laughs> I plan on working till the day I go home. I plan on preaching as long as anybody will give me an opportunity to preach. 
I'll pastor as long as I, I can pastor. As long as I got breath, as long as the Word of God is in my mind and in my heart, I want to do it with all that I can. And when I can't do it any longer, I'm going to find me some young preacher and I'm going to wear him out. <laughs> Amen? But I'm going to go to heaven doing the very best that I can to live the truth, to, to let the truth be my guide and my hope. But there's too much lies in this world. There's too many people that, that are commingling with what they think, with what is true. Well, my mama always said, there's a better truth. I love in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus started hitting them upside the head and said, you have heard it said of by those who old, but I say to you. I don't care what you've always thought. I don't care those things. The Word of God is true. One of the things I'm trying my best to get apart is just because you haven't had an experience in your past, that does not mean that it is present in your today. You may have had a failure in the past. That doesn't mean you're a failure today. We are supposed to be people who are seeking to, to honor God and please God and allow God to, to be great and alive in our life. And, and we think, well, I just can't. That's a safe lie. Yes, you can. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And you're getting uncomfortable, I can tell by watching. I know how to read a room. And you're getting up. I'll even wave to the audience up there in that balcony. Amen? <coughs> We get uncomfortable when somebody starts to asking us to trust God to do more than what we can see and what we can feel. Because we've done the other for too long. I'm just asking you to let Jesus be Jesus. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He came to set the captives free. He said, I've got a greater truth for you. Don't tempt the Lord your God. Just trust the Lord your God is what he's saying. There's a third one. My time's gone. Y'all are going to have to help me out here. <laughs> Look what he says in verse 8. The devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Satan said to him, all these things I will give you. Bless his heart. <laughs> talking to the Creator. Like He has the right to give us something. I believe the owner is the only one who has the right. Amen? Amen? All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship. That's what He wants. So here's the thought. How much are you going to trust him? How much are you going to believe him? How much are you going to say, I don't care about what anything, I'm going to live the word of God. I'm going to worship him and him only. One God, one master, one Lord, one Savior. You see, you know what Satan's doing? He's saying, follow me. <laughs> follow me. And you won't have to go to the cross. Follow me. All this can be yours. Can I say, I don't want all this. Why in the world would I get such a short end of the stick? I want to go to a place where there's no more death. I want to go to the place where there's no more heartache. I want to go to the place where there's only love. I want to go to the place where there's peace forevermore. I want to go to the place where there's joy. Endless joy. I want to go to the place where money doesn't matter. I want to go to the place where it does, everybody's beautiful in the eyes of God and for the first time we accept it and we believe it. I want to go to the place where when I get there it's going to be so much fun. I don't want to ever want to leave. Because you see, that's what lasts. But the lie is for a season. Sin thrills, Brother Casey. Then it kills. You may think, I've got to have this. Really? I can't do that. Really? Really? I just can't get old Peter out of my mind. In the boat, in the storm, in the circumstance, 
He looks out there and he sees Jesus standing in peace. Lord, let me come to you. Bid me come to you. He looks a whole lot better where you are than where I am. And I love Jesus' response, Gary. Come on. You want it? Come on. And he walked out the impossible. Are y'all good with that? Then he stopped and started thinking, hey, I can't do this. This is impossible. And things took control. Why is it that we can walk out the truth and go back to believing the old lie and fall and pray to it? What we need is a Lord help moment. Because I would say most of us in this building, we've walked out the truth. Amen? There's been some times we've walked out the truth, but then there's been some times where there's been some co-mingling of a lie in there. Satan's been whispering in our ear, God can't love you. God won't forgive you. God won't, God won't bless you. Oh, really? Really? Exceedingly abundantly above what Ephesians 14, 3.20. He wants to do exceedingly abundantly above. So let me just ask you right now. This is going to be the test right now. How much do you think God can do in you? How much are you willing to trust His truth in you? Now I understand that we're waiting for that moment when we get it right. I, I heard a preacher talking about when he was young, his parents were eating ice cream Watching a Jane Fonda workout. <laughs> How many of y'all remember the Jane Fonda workout? And they're eating ice cream watching the workout. So he asked the question. He said, what are you doing watching this, eating Briar's ice cream? And they said, this is what they said. Well, we've got to figure out what we need to do. <laughs> Wouldn't it be better just to put down the ice cream and actually start? <laughs> Couldn't we just start right where we are? Couldn't we just start with the truth that's right there in front of us? Couldn't we just believe God in the next thing that's before us? Can't we just believe that He loves us? That'd be a great place to start, wouldn't it? He loves you with an everlasting love. There's a world out there that's starving, looking for something. And here we have the truth. May we never keep it to ourselves. They want to look at something. They want to know, is this real? So God may allow you to go through some mighty difficult circumstances. So that everybody will look at it and see it, try it out in you, the fire of the circumstance in you, so that you can say, it is real. I'm going to say one last thing. I want to hush. I love Paul's perspective on this because he says when we get to heaven and we look back upon the things that we went through that were hard and difficult, where we got mad at God, he says we're going to look at it. Here's his words. Momentary light affliction. Compared to the glory. Full of grace and truth. So let me just ask you. I know my Lord has got his finger on some place in your life. I know there's something in your life that he's been talking about. Say, Pastor, what's the invitation? That's the invitation. Can we just start right there? Obviously, if you don't know Jesus, you got to start there. Right? But there's probably some point of obedience for you Christians. And at that point of obedience, that's where it begins. Right. Father, I thank you for your word. You are good. You are God. You can't
came that we may know truth and the truth would set us free. So Lord, even today, even now, set us free. Father, I do not have any idea of all the things that the people in this building are facing, but you do. And Lord Jesus, your word tells us that you've already prayed for us this day. And Lord, that you so much want for us to move from where we are to where you would have us to be. Lord, that we would not only know truth, but live truth and believe truth and trust truth. Jesus, you are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. Oh, God, set us free. And, Lord, let it begin in me. Father, may this invitation be Holy Spirit given for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.